Today's speaker <laughs> is Manuel Powers from the famous Risk Institute in Linz, Austria, who will speak about where is the cheapest situation. Okay, thank you for inviting me and for introducing me. Um, uh, before I start, I want to make an advertisement that uh, also I will talk about joint work with Sao Si Chen, who will be speaking here. No, not here. <laughs> in, in the other, in the other one, in four weeks from now, uh, he is now with Michael Singer in North Carolina, and he used to be. He was a student of uh, the French uh, group in Paris, Frédéric Chissac and uh, his colleagues. He did his PhD there. And then he came to me for half a year or so, less, as a postdoc. And now I moved him on to Michael, because half, half a year was quite enough. Um, but we did some good work, that, and that's what I want to tell you about. And the other thing um, is uh, I want to point out what RISC is. Um, RISC is an institute of the University of Linz. And uh, I don't know who in the room knows what the uh, intimate co um, um, connection between uh, New Brunswick and Linz is. No idea. They have the same uh, phone prefix. Nationally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just. <coughs> And apart from that, um, RISC is known uh, <coughs> because it's located in this wonderful castle. It was founded by Bruno Buchberger. Bruno Buchberger is known for having invented Godner bases. So who knows Godner bases? Uh, everybody except one, so that's not enough. Uh, I will explain what Godner bases are um, before I start to talk about what I actually want to talk about. Um, so I will explain Godner bases with pictures. Um, and I will use two variables only because this device happens to have only two dimensions. So uh, let's talk about polynomials in two variables. And I will depict a polynomial like this. So a polynomial uh, is the sum of terms where uh, every term is such a bullet. So that would be x squared times y, and that would be x times y cubed, and so on. And each of them has some coefficient in front, which I don't care about. And then the polynomial is the sum of all these terms. <coughs> Um, and then there's uh, something um, uh, we would like to uh, single out the biggest term, the highest term. Um, we have some freedom of doing this. We can take either, either this one, uh, because it has not, no other term uh, above. Uh, and we can also take this one. It does, doesn't matter. We have to choose it somehow, but we cannot choose either of the others. We cannot choose only this. And then uh, uh, <coughs> what matters is what, what happens when you multiply this polynomial by a term. So by some power product, x to the something times y to the something. That means uh, that uh, we'll have the effect of shifting this uh, group of points, shifting it around. You shift it to above or to the right or to something. So that this blue point um, will move through this area. <coughs> okay? So that, that's a typical picture in the theory of Kodner bases. And then if you have another polynomial, um, then you can again ask what is the leading term. Okay, you choose it somehow. Let's say you choose this, and you have again such a cone um, where this uh, leading term can be moved if you multiply this polynomial by a term. So now you have two polynomials, the one from before and this one. And then the key question, so let's say these are the polynomials P1 and P2. And then the key question is, is it possible to find some other polynomials q1 and q2, such that when I add them, I get a new polynomial, let's say p3, which does not have any terms in the blue area. Is that possible or not? Well, it depends. Um, usually, you would expect it's not possible, because when you uh, multiply with q, that means you move this into the blue area and move this in the blue area. But then there can be some ma magic cancellation and it's possible that uh, something is left down here but nothing is left up there. So it could be that it's possible to generate this polynomial as a linear combination of those two <laughs> with polynomial coefficients. And if that's uh, the case, then we are not happy. So we would add this uh, and would repeat the process and get more and more polynomials until at some point it stops. And when it stops, then we say this is a Grotner basis. 
And when you have a Grobner basis, then you are happy because then you know everything about the, the polynomials that you started with. You can solve algebraic equations and all this kind of stuff, um, which is not visible from this picture, but I wanted to have only pictures on the slide, so I cannot explain you what this is good for, just to give you an idea what is going on when you compute a Grobner basis. Um, and <coughs> it's funny when I, uh, when I talk about this in a lecture at risk, and then the students somehow say, yeah, okay, nice. Uh, are we learning this only because this institute was founded by Bruno? Mm -hmm. uh, I say, no, 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 this is very important, but um, it's hard to convey this message because we know from Jesus already that the mm -hmm. prophets are not uh, recognized in their home base often, um, so I have to make an effort. I told you now, but that was just a commercial. Now we come to uh, something else. Uh, which, however, has very similar pictures. That's why I made this introduction. So now we talk about Zeitwagen's algorithm. Um, in the um, in the original version. So let's talk about the summation of hypergeometric terms. So we have uh, f of n, uh, which is uh, sum over k over some term f n k, where this is a very simple thing, uh, and this, after you sum over all k, is not so simple anymore. And what we want is to describe this small f of n question. Only the better marker. Oh, maybe in the box. This is no. worse. Maybe in the box. In the box. There is a box. Left. Right there. This one. Is there? It's empty. Oh, it's empty. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Does this work? It's a little bit. Yeah. That's better. This one's also not bad. Oh, thank you. Okay. Okay, so what we want is we have, we have given uh, such a thing that we can uh, compute one by one for a specific end, but we want to uh, we want to understand this sequence as a whole, and to understand this as a whole means we want to have a recurrence equation, we want to have something of the form uh, a0 of n, f of n, plus a1 of n, f of n plus 1, plus, and so on, plus ar of n, f n plus r equals 0. That's what we want. So we want to have a recurrence, a linear recurrence with polynomial coefficients. So the a's are polynomials. Um, and this, this recurrence has an order and a degree. The order is this r, which is fixed, something like 5 or 3 or so. The n is just n. And the a's are polynomials. Use the the a's are polynomials uh, in n of some degree. Um, not necessarily the same, but let's say it's, uh, we, we bound it somehow, we say of degree d or less. Okay, and then so that means there are two characteristic parameters for, for measuring the size of such an object. One is the r, the order, and the other is the d, the degree of the polynomial coefficients. And then there is a theory which says whenever you have such an f, such an f, uh, then this f, which is the sum of it, has such an equation of some r and some d. Okay, so let's <coughs> let's see how this looks. Um, let's say this is r here, and this is d, and then you have some equation. For example, this. So you have that would be an equation of order 11 and degree of 14. Consists of some terms. So every column here corresponds to one of the a's. And the dots are the coefficients of the a's. If you write the a, uh, each a here is a11 plus a1, uh, so 0, 1n plus a1d n to the d. So then these, <coughs> these coefficients, which are just numbers, they are represented here by the bullets. Okay. Similar as I did it before for the when I explain Kodner basis. So K, K is the index for the columns, or in this picture, I don't... K, there's no K. So this is gone. You have just a sequence yeah. of numbers, oh. and it satisfies a recurrence. Okay. And we don't, we forget where it came from. Oh, all right. So it just satisfies a recurrence, which has order R, 
and polynomial coefficients where the polynomials have degree d. Okay. So the only thing that you have is r and d. Um, so this here is r and this is d. Okay. And each, each column is one of the a's here, which consists of, which is a polynomial, so it consists of a coefficient vector, and these are the, the bullets in the column. Okay? okay. Clear? Okay. So let's again do something similar as before. We, we, are not, we don't want to draw the entire picture. Uh, just think about something that somehow the leading term, this one. Now, um, if you have this one, then uh, you'll observe that the, uh, the recurrence is not uniquely determined. If you have one recurrence, you can do, uh, create many out of them. For example, you can take this recurrence and multiply it by n. You have another one, which has degree one higher. You can multiply it by n to the 100, it's still two, because if this is zero, <laughs> and multiply it by something, it's still zero. So if you have some recurrence with the leading term here, then you have also easily a recurrence anywhere here. <coughs> because you take the one that you have here and multiply it up, just as before. And that's not all. You can also take, uh, take this recurrence and replace n by n plus 5. Then you get a recurrence that has order r plus 5. So you can fill, again, you can fill the entire cube. So you can find recurrences. If there's a recurrence with leading term here, then there's also a recurrence with a leading term anywhere in the blue area. Because the recurrence is not uniquely determined. Um, and now the naive uh, 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 ideas would be that, that that's now all. So you have found this one, this is the recurrence, and it generates all the others, but uh, life is not so simple. Uh, in fact, when you have such a summation problem, but it turns out that you have uh, something like this. So you have a finite union of such cones. There is a recurrence here, and all the things that follow from it. One is here, <coughs> and one is here, and so on and so on. Uh, okay. And what you want is, you have given this, you want a recurrence. You don't care which. You want just a recurrence. Okay. So which one do we take? In the beginning, we don't know anything. In the beginning, everything is black. And we don't know where they are. We know, okay, by theory, we know somewhere there is a blue area. But we don't know where it is. We would like to compute one point uh, that corresponds to such a recurrence. <coughs> Uh, and preferably one that doesn't cost us too much time, computation time. Okay, so let's see. Uh, how do we get such a recurrence? There are two ways. No, there are many ways, but I, I will talk about two. Uh, one is uh, guessing, and the other is Seilberg's algorithm. So let's do the simple one first, guessing. So how do you do this? So you say, um, you make an ansatz. You know what you're looking for. You choose the D and the R. Somehow, we will see later how. And you want to find the A, the AIJ. So you make an ansatz like this. Uh, A, zero, zero, F of N, plus A, zero, one, F of N plus one, plus, and so on, A, zero, R, f n plus r and plus so that was all the constant terms now a 1 0 n f n plus a 1 r n f n plus r and so on in the end a, a d 0 n d f n plus a d r f n plus r, and that's supposed to be zero for all n. Okay, I'm, I'm sure Don has shown this to you at least a hundred times. Um, okay, so that's what you want to find. You want to find a's which are constant and which satisfy this for all n. So, uh, how many a's do we have? Uh, we have here um, r, r plus one, because we start with zero, and here we have d plus one. So we have um, r plus 1 times d plus 1 um, unknowns. Haven't you switched the notation on the subscripts for the a? Ah, compared to here? Yeah. Yeah, it could be. Ah, uh, yeah, you're right. So 
So that would, that would be this column now, this one. Right, thank you. Okay, so these are unknowns. That's the number of unknowns. They depend on the choice I've made for R and D. Still some time left. Hmm. Um, okay, and then now suppose that uh, we can compute what this sum is for specific n's, for n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, up to n, up to capital N. So let's compute f of n for uh, n from 1, 2, up to n. And let's say n is so that afterwards it becomes painful to compute further terms. Um, then what can we do with these values? We can plug in, in this ansatz, uh, one of the n's. If you plug in n equals 1, for example, then everything here will become a number. So the f of n will become f of 1. We have computed it. We know this is uh, 5 over 3. And this will become a number, and this will become a number. All of them will be become a number. And I have a linear constraint on the a's. So I have, I have 5 uh, a0, 0, 0 plus 7 a0 is equal to 0. If I do it for another n, I get another constraint, and so on. So uh, how, how many constraints can I get? So if I have only n terms, I can get uh, n minus r constraints, because I have here uh, this shift, and I have to compensate it. So I have n minus r equations. Um, and what I want is to make this overdetermined, uh, so that I'm sure that the equations that I get are really true, uh, well, at least reasonably sure and uh, heuristically sure. So I will, I will choose, so the n is uh, what I've given, and I will choose uh, r and d, such that um, there are more equations than unknowns. So r plus 1, d plus 1 <coughs> is um, less than n minus r. Okay. So, and in any such ansatz, I can find at least a candidate for such an equation. Um, so and now you see if you if you solve this for for uh, you keep consider n as a, a constant because that's just the terms that you have given and now uh, ask what r's and d can I choose and this is somehow a, a hyperbola that says something which depends here on r so how how does this look there's a picture I know you know how the uh, hyperbola looks so this is if you have for example, if you have uh, 30 terms, you didn't manage to compute more than 30 terms. So what can you do? You can make an answer like this and so, uh, search for a recurrence of order, I don't know what this is, uh, 6 or 5 and a degree uh, 3. And that is not your only choice. You can also try something like this, a shorter, uh, uh, shorter recurrence with higher degree or a higher recurrence with shorter degree, smaller degree. That's, so you can go, you can make your answer somewhere below the, uh, below the hyperbola. And if you don't find anything, then, then you haven't found anything. Uh, then you need more terms. You have to increase the end. You have to make a bigger effort of computing more terms. So if you compute more terms, then you can make <coughs> a bigger answer. And uh, you will find in this example uh, that when you go as far as here, I don't know what this is, maybe 200 terms or so, then here you see, ah, there's something. You have found something. You have found something. And then you're happy. Because then you have something and you can try to prove that it's really true, if you, if you mind. You can also just believe it because it's true anyway. OK. But then you have only some recurrence, this one and this one. If you're stupid, you want to have a proof. Yeah. Or if your advisor asks for a proof, <laughs> depending on where you are, who, who your advisor is. OK. Uh, but you still don't know uh, everything. You just know there's something. Uh, and depending on what you want, uh, that may not be enough. So uh, uh, if you really want to have the blue area, then you have to do some more. But compare. Uh, some people like this recurrence best uh, because it has the shortest order. And from the shortest order, you get asymptotics and funny things uh, more easily than from one of these. Uh, but Think of this, how, how, how many terms would you have needed to compute all these coefficients? They have such a high degree and such a low order, compared to the one that we found first, which has a bit of higher order, but a much less degree. So this one is cheaper. Huh? Um, and there's a way, because everybody likes this one, to get from here uh, to there. If you take two of them, you can do, uh, if you consider this as an operator, and you have two of them, Usually, you have two of them, and if you do this, then you can compute their uh, 
um, greatest common write divisor as operators, and then that will, with probability one, be exactly this one. So you can compute this cheap recurrence, uh, and nevertheless get the one that interest is more interesting for you. Okay. But in, in the beginning, you know nothing. So yeah. And in the beginning, you don't know where this is, and you don't know how many terms you need, so you have to compute as many terms as you can and check whether you find something. <coughs> right? Good. So now let's, uh, that, that's about guessing. That was easy. Now about creative telescoping, that's also easy, but it's different. Creative telescoping, I'm sure he has told you before, a hundred times or so. So the idea is now uh, different. So again, we, uh, we want to find the recurrence for this. This has not changed. Uh, but we find it now in a different way. We are not uh, doing some um, ansatz and guessing and uh, doing proper things, but we do proper things. Uh, and we use the definition of the F. I'm not giving you uh, details of how uh, this is done, because that's not what I'm after. Um, but the idea is this, so you, uh, again you want to find the recurrence A0, N, Fn, plus Zz, plus AR, N, F, N plus R, equals zero. And the way uh, you do it now is you uh, use some algebraic algorithm to come up with such A's and a Q uh, with the property that something is satisfied for the summand. So you have A0, N, F, N, K, plus a r n f n plus r k is equal to and then there's some other some auxiliary uh, thing q is let me write it like this a bit oversimplified minus n q um, the idea is that now if you have this and you sum it then you get this okay um, and uh, what Seibach's algorithm does is uh, um, it computes such a thing given the f, so given defining equations for the f. And uh, the difference to guessing is that you, you don't have a d now. Um, you still have a d because these are still polynomials and they have a certain degree, but you don't need to specify the d in advance. You have to specify only the r in advance and the algorithm will tell you what the d is. So the picture is this. So you start from choosing r equals 1, for example, and then you can ask Doran if there's anything of any degree, no matter how, he will tell you, uh, that satisfies this equation, and the q, which is not shown in the picture. And if that's the case, then you are done. If it's not the case, you go to the next and try again, and see if there's any a, in a no matter what degree, uh, that satisfies the equation. If you're happy, if you're done, then you're happy, and so on. And so you will uh, do this one step after the other until here you find uh, what everybody is looking for, the uh, recurrence with shortest uh, order. Here we are. So that's the recurrence with shortest order. And that's what all maple and everything, that's what they all compute. They, they compute this. Uh, and the question I want to, the point I want to make is that this is not necessarily the best choice. What if you go higher with the order? Like this, for example. Maybe that's better. It, you, it was better before for guessing, so maybe it's better also here, even though we would find this. Maybe we don't want to find this. Maybe we want to find this, uh, or maybe this, or this. Yeah, I don't know. In the beginning, we don't know where the blue area is. If we knew where the blue area is, we could do some calculations and say, oh, the cheapest one would be the one there, and then we compute this. But in the beginning, we don't know. So what would be cool to have is such a curve. Uh, such a curve that uh, describes the boundary of the blue area, but we don't know the blue area. Of course, we could compute all the points, and then afterwards we have the curve. But that, 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 that doesn't make sense, because the reason for having the blue curve is to use it for determining which one is cheapest to compute, because we assume uh, things are so big that we cannot compute them all. Uh, so we need to know where the blue area is without computing the blue area. Right? So that would be cool to have, right? Hmm? Okay, and that's what we have. Um, so the the work uh, I did with the Chinese guy mentioned on the first slide and talking in this seminar in the other room in four weeks um, is this. 
we have a, a rational function uh, that describes this blue curve. So we have something that says, um, so creative telescoping succeeds. No. Yeah, no. Okay. So the creative telescoping can produce um, 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 relations, so such uh, equations of degree d and order r if r and d are such that okay now uh, d is greater than ah, okay let's be uh, conceptual something times r plus something something times r plus something. It's as easy as this. And, and now, uh, uh, knowing this, uh, you can, so that, that's somehow if you put equal here, that's the blue curve. <laughs> Having this, so I, I, I can tell you later what these uh, things are, they are a bit, a bit ugly, um, and they don't matter. They, are, they matter if you really want to know it, but uh, not if you want to know what it's good for. Um, so what can you do now? You can compute, for example, you can predict the degree of the uh, of the lowest order recurrence. Um, so that because that's just okay. So this will have an asymptote somewhere, a vertical asymptote, because this is really a minus. Uh, and then you take just uh, if this is the asymptote, the next one it has a degree. This is the degree. Okay, so you can. You can compute where, where is this degree? What, what is the degree of the least order equation? It's a high one, so it's 40 uh, something. Or you can compute where is the, what is the order of the least degree equation, which is somewhere here. So where is it? Here. <coughs> you can also compute this because you know, okay, this will go asymptotically to this over this. Uh, okay, and then plus one because this will never be reached, the asymptotic value, but plus one and then ceiling and so on, so it gives you this point. It will tell you first what is the degree of the minimal degree equation, and then if you have the degree, you can compute the and get also the r. Where this happens. So that's cool, huh? And, but that's not all. You can compute also, um, so th 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 that's somehow the, you, you can minimize anything. Because that's a very simple thing. So you can uh, compute also the uh, order where the uh, cost, or no, where the size of the output is minimal. So how would you do that? Um, so remember, the size of the output is essentially d plus one times r plus one. So that's that's uh, size. And how do we make this minimal? So uh, I know that. Uh, Doran hates everything which is discrete and finite, and loves everything which is uh, infinite and real. So, uh, because of this, let's just forget that d and r are re uh, uh, integers. Let's consider them as reals, and then just say, okay, this here is, find this as a function. Plug this in here, and you have uh, d of r plus one, r plus one, and then it, it's very simple very simple calculus, so you take f prime of r is, is equal to the derivative of this rational function, set this to zero, and then you know r is equal to where this becomes minimal. Of course, then in the end you have to round to the nearest integer, but anyway, so here you have uh, some points. Uh, so uh, let, let's try if I remember what they mean. But when you assume that it's, it's dense, it's considerable that it's not everything. Not all, many computers are zero, but it never happens in real life. Yeah, so this, uh, this, uh, um, it does, this does not happen, yeah. and if it happens, I cannot predict it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I really, yeah, in this, it, it's an estimate, it's an upper bound. Yeah, but empirically, it doesn't happen. You, no, usually if the, if the things are not trivial in size, then they are dense. Yeah. Well, not quite. Um, so I, I was assuming here for simplicity that uh, the support is like this. Um, in real life, uh, the support is something like 
this. But that's okay because we know what is happening here. So I oversimplified it only. So I can take, if you want, I can take this into account. It makes the formula more complicated, but the reasoning is the same. Okay, so let's see. What is this? Um, I think this is the one there where I say the output size should be minimal. Um, this is. Oh,